I'm Shahar Azani and welcome to this JBS special honoring the legacy of Iranian Jewry. Much has been told and shared about the crimes of the current regime in Tehran. Only recently we have witnessed its nefarious impact on the region as a whole and in the Israeli-Palestinian arena specifically as it propelled Palestinian terror from Gaza with hundreds of missiles fired indiscriminately at innocent civilians in Israel. May 9, 2023 marked the 44th anniversary of the execution of Iran's late Jewish leader Habib El Ghanian. In 1979, El Ghanian was arrested by the Khomeini regime and accused of being a Zionist and American spy. And after a 20-minute trial, El Ghanian was executed. He was the first Jew murdered by the regime, but sadly, not the last one. His execution sparked the massive exodus of thousands of Jews from Iran after having lived there for thousands of years. The Jews of Iran were no longer safe in Khomeini's new radical Islamic nation. To understand more about the rich history of the Iranian Jewish community and the significance of this unique leader, I have the pleasure of speaking today with our dear friend Carmel Melamed, an internationally renowned and published award-winning Iranian-American journalist and author based in Southern California and a good friend. Carmel, thank you so much for joining me on JBS today. Thank you, Shahar. Thank you so much for having me and uh, to JBS for having this special event to honor Mr. Iranian. He wasn't just an icon for the Iranian Jewish community, but he was uh, an incredible patriot for Iran. Let's talk a little bit. First of all, you know, it, it, it's a well-known fact that we have a large Iranian Jewish community here in the United States, on the West and East Coast and elsewhere. And it'll be very interesting to understand a little bit more about the rich history of your community, Carmel. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about uh, his leadership style? What makes him stand out as, like you say, an Iranian Jewish icon? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, he was the uh, quintessential uh, Jewish entrepreneur uh, for the 20th century in Iran. He was one of the most successful industrialists, uh, creating thousands of jobs for uh, mostly non-Jewish Iranians. And he had so much success in business and entrepreneurship in different spheres uh, that eventually the Jewish community stepped forward and asked him to lead them. Uh, he had a tremendous pull in the non-Jewish uh, Iranian community nationwide. Uh, he had tremendous pull uh, internationally with trade and business. And he had a tremendous love for the Jewish community and an even greater love for Iranians in general, all Iranians of all faiths. And they thought that he would be a tremendous leader. And in the late 1950s, all the way up to 1979, he served as the community's leader uh, with tremendous success and, and great honor. Was he ever acknowledged by Iranian society, the non-Jewish uh, Iranian society, for these contributions, like you say, for somebody who was, you know, first and foremost, an Iranian patriot? Uh, unfortunately, uh, he has not. He was not in during his lifetime. He was not during after his death for the last 44 years. Uh, there have been individual organizations that have had uh, some small events to honor his memory, the non-Jewish Iranian community, but uh, nothing substantial, nothing on a national level or an international level. Um, he did a tremendous amount for Iranian society. Uh, he not only established uh, a number of industrial businesses, uh, such as Plasco Car. It was the first uh, plastic injection molded company. They made consumer plastic products like combs and bowls and baskets and any kind of plastic uh, goods that you could imagine. Um, he also, him and his brothers together, uh, built the first modern skyscraper in Tehran. Uh, it was the uh, Plasco building in 1962. And the second uh, skyscraper in Tehran, it was called the Aluminum Building. Um, unfortunately, in 2007, the Iranian regime, uh, their mismanagement of the building 
uh, which they had confiscated uh, after the revolution, caused the Plasco building to collapse. But um, it, it was an icon for many, many decades in, in Tehran. And it was a huge, huge achievement uh, for all Iranians. Um, he helped man of, he helped pay for the construction costs for the Hossein Yerushad Mosque. It, it, it's unheard of. I have not heard of any Jew contributing to the construction of a mosque anywhere in the Arab or Islamic world right. uh, in, in, in ancient times, in old times, or in modern times. Uh, and that's what happened in 1967 with Mr. al The Islamic leaders uh, in Tehran approached him and said, we're building the Hossein Yerushad Mosque. Unfortunately, we've come short of funds, and we don't have anyone that is ready to give the money to complete the construction of the mosque. Can you help us? And he didn't blink an eye. He did not blink an eye. He took out his checkbook and wrote a massive check toward that construction. And he told them, come back in a few days and I will have additional funds contributed by other Jewish business people. And they were shocked. They were surprised. And they said, you're a Jew. Why are you doing this? And he said, I might be a Jew, but I am also a proud Iranian. I live in this country. This is a place of prayer. It is a place of uh, worship. And it gives me great pride to be a part of it. Um, another area that he was involved with was with trade, international trade. Before Nixon and the U.S. approached China uh, in the early 1970s, it was Mr. Alganyan with the Iranian Chamber of Commerce that traveled to China. They met with Mao Zedong and they began the seeds of trade, international trade between Iran and China. So the trade that you see today or the relations that you see today between uh, Iran and China were begun by Mr. Alganyan and some of uh, the business people in the it's, uh, it's, Iranian Chamber of Commerce. It's quite interesting to think about this, especially today with the uh, Chinese-mediated um, agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So the way the way things turn out. But I want to ask you: You open the window into the history of the Jewish community before the rise of uh, the evil Khomeini regime, and I want to ask you: How were the Jews treated and perceived in Iran before the revolution and? The same question that pops to mind, in my mind, I'm sure is popping to many others. It's not just for um, Habib al Ghanian to give them the money, but they chose to come to him for the money. How does that shed light on the relationship between Jews and non-Jews in Iran pre-revolution? Well, there, there was a tremendous amount of uh, respect and tolerance for uh, the Jews in, in Iran. Um, shall I say, starting from 1925, the beginning of the Pahlavi King dynasties, not the late Shah, but it really started with the late Shah's father, Reza Shah. And he came to power in 1925, and he was really a, a nationalist. Uh, he set aside some of the uh, radical Islamic views of the clerics and the, and the previous monarchy. And he said, look, we are all Iranians. Jews, Muslims, Christians, Zoroastrians, Baha'is, we are allowing, he basically allowed all Iranians of all faiths to practice their religions without uh, harassment. He allowed the Jews to leave their poverty-stricken ghettos, obtain higher education, uh, be involved in uh, the day-to-day -day lives and, and, and business in, in Iran, he was truly the modern emancipator of the Jews of Iran, and they were allowed to flourish. They went into education, they went into business, medicine, science, engineering. Uh, they, they really flourished, and it continued with his son, uh, the late Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. And uh, the Jews flourished, and they obtained a tremendous amount of financial success, educational success, and they became an integral part of uh, Iranian society. And uh, to your question, um, I think the clerics in, in 1967 in Tehran were desperate. Uh, 
Uh, they had gone to other philanthropic individuals, other organizations, and everyone had turned them down. Uh, they were told by other business people that Mr. Alghanian was a very generous man. Um, he did not turn away anyone, uh, Jew, Muslim, Christian, that approached him for help. I actually interviewed um, one of the business people that uh, worked with him that was not Jewish, his name was uh, Nasser Oliyai, and he actually lives today in Newport Beach, California. And he told me that uh, on many occasions during the course of the week, you had Islamic clerics approach Mr. Alghanian in his office in the aluminum building in Tehran for help, charitable help. Uh, they knew he was generous. They knew he was a patriot of Iran, and he had no problem. Uh, being generous and, and helping people. Um, he was just, he was a loving human being and he was proud. He was proud of his country, Iran. And he was a proud Iranian and a proud Iranian Jew. You mentioned he was the leader of the Jewish community for many years? Absolutely. From the late 1950s all the way up to his death in 1979, uh, he was very dedicated to uh, the safety, the security, the success of uh, the Jewish community um, many times stepped forward and helped uh, individuals that were struggling financially, um, bringing the community together when they had disputes, um, helping individuals that were struggling uh, with their day-to-day -day lives. Um, there are many, many stories of uh, his, his charity toward uh, the Jewish organizations. One of the most famous is the Sapir Hospital. Uh, it was the only Jewish hospital in Tehran. It was created in the late 1930s, a nonprofit Jewish hospital created in Tehran by a gentleman, Jewish doctor by the name of Dr. Roholot Sapir. And Dr. Sapir established the hospital for a medical facility to treat the Jews. Uh, many of the general hospitals in Tehran rejected the Jews or were very neglected of them. Uh, unfortunately, because of societal anti-Semitism, uh, some individuals, even though the government was not openly uh, participating in anti-Semitism, there were still individuals that were anti-Semitic, doctors that didn't want to treat Jews. They claimed that they were dirty uh, the Persian word is najis, ritually impure. And so Dr. Sapir set up the hospital as a nonprofit for poverty-stricken uh, Iranian Jews. And over the years, the hospital needed uh, upgrading, and uh, reconstruction, expansion, new equipment. And Mr. Alghanian in the late 1960s and the 70s uh, provided the funds and a lot of the uh, construction uh, supplies, the um, uh, the wood supplies, the aluminum uh, supplies. He was an industrialist. He had those factories that produced those um, raw uh, products. So the Sapir Hospital was one of the examples of just the many that he did for the Jewish community in uh, in Iran. So. Habib al Ghanian was not just a Jewish leader and icon, but an Iranian patriot, like you continuously emphasize. Somebody who worked hard to develop Iran internally and also to a degree represent Iran in its international trade globally. This is someone who was very precious to Iranian society itself and, as you said, was appreciated by many. How did we reach a point of his execution? Uh, it, it was very unfortunate. Um, I think uh, Iran, 44 years ago in the 1979 revolution, was wrapped up um, in a lot of the uh, rhetoric of the Khomeini regime that claimed that uh, outsiders, uh, foreign forces that were disloyal to um, Iran uh, were undermining supposedly undermining the Iranian uh, nation and sucking the wealth of the Iranian nation. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the population 
believed those lies. Uh, they believed um, the attacks from the regime's uh, leaders, Khomeini and others. Uh, their number one target were the Jews. Um, again, like many instances we see uh, throughout history, Nazi Germany, um, the Soviet Union, the Jews are a great scapegoat. Um, point to the Jews as a source of, you know, your discomfort. Uh, you don't have certain things. It's the Jews' fault. And they were a great quintessential uh, scapegoat. And unfortunately, many individuals got wrapped up in that. Um, it's fair to say that there were uh, hundreds of Mr. Alghanian's uh, employees that he helped over the years. Uh, there were community leaders, non-Jewish and Jewish, that stepped forward uh, to intervene on his behalf. The clerics, um, Carmel, well, the, cl the, the clerics, the, he contributed the clerics, to the building of a mosque. Yeah, unfortunately, the clerics were nowhere to be found. Uh, they said nothing, um, and they were, they were dead silent. Um, there, there were many non-Jews that stepped forward to intervene on his behalf. Unfortunately, uh, the, the Khomeini regime was hell-bent on executing him, and not just him personally, but it was uh, to send a message, uh, several messages. The number one message was to Iran's Jews, that they were no longer welcome in Khomeini's uh, Iran, that they were going to be relegated to third-class citizenship, their rights, uh, some of the protections that they enjoyed under the Shah's regime were going to be taken away. And they essentially wanted to scare the Jews away from Iran to confiscate their wealth, to confiscate their assets. And, and it worked, uh, not just with El Ghanian, but each one of the subsequent Jews that the regime executed, thousands of Jews fled. They just left their assets, their businesses, their homes, and fled the country. The second message was to international Jewry and to Israel, um, that this new regime was going to take revenge on Israel uh, because of their Jew hatred by executing an innocent Jew. Um, and they were going to, quote unquote, champion Palestinian rights and the Palestinian cause by um, executing Jews in Iran. Really vile and disgusting message, um, but uh, it came, uh, came to fruition with Mr. Alvanian's uh, sham trial and also with his subsequent execution. And it's, it really sent shockwaves uh, throughout uh, the Jewish community in Iran, uh, in America and, and, and worldwide, that this very well-known and successful Jewish leader was randomly executed for no reason. Not much has changed when you use the word vile to describe the regime in Tehran today. I mentioned at the beginning the uh, uh, destabilizing, to say the least, role they play regionally and internationally, from what the regime does in Syria to undermine stability in this war-torn country, to uh, stranglehold Lebanon, using Hezbollah to destroy, almost annihilate Yemen, with the, uh, with the rise of the Houthis, of course, naturally, their use of the Palestinians with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, they're bent on misery. What is the lesson, Carmel, when you look back uh, into the history books, uh, when you look back uh, to the role of Habib al ghanian within Iranian society in general and the Jewish community, what comes to your mind and other members of the community's mind when you think about Habib's role um, in his actions in the past? What kind of lessons can we drive from these to the present and the future? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the hardest lesson that we can learn is that Jews worldwide uh, are not safe um, when they live outside of Israel. This is a very sad reality, uh, whether it's in the Middle East or Europe or, and, or even here in the United States. Um, there is always a danger to our safety and to our security. And in essence, our only true safe haven, the only place that we are physically safe uh, in the long term is the state of Israel, the homeland of the Jewish people. This is a hard lesson that uh, the Iranian Jewish community has learned as a result of 
uh, Mr. Alvanian's execution uh, and other executions, um, we have no other safe haven. We have no other place than the Jewish homeland. Uh, this is the uh, largest lesson. I think the other great lesson of Mr. Alvanian's life and his legacy is that um, Jews, especially in the Islamic world, in the Arab world, can contribute uh, successfully in an uh, environment which is not involved with radical uh, theology following uh, radical Islam or any kind of radical uh, religion. Uh, Jews can succeed and, uh, and other groups can succeed in the Arab world and the Islamic world if there's tolerance from the government, uh, if there is moderation, um, there is a tremendous amount of potential. And we're seeing that today with the Abraham Accords in places like Morocco, uh, Bahrain, uh, the UAE, uh, they have created an environment of tolerance and coexistence. And this was the environment that existed for 50 years in Iran and allowed individuals like Habib al Ghanian to flourish. And as a result, Iran prospered and the region prospered. Uh, so there is a potential for coexistence if the government, if the people set aside some of the radical views and uh, embrace tolerance and coexistence. It's clear, uh, Carmel, that you and other members of the Iranian Jewish community look back at Habib al Ghanian with great pride um, of the rich history and contributions of Iranian Jews to Iran itself and to Iranian society. I have to ask you, thinking um, into the future, and of course we all share the hope that this regime will be toppled one way or another. Do you see any desire by members of the Iranian Jewish community to return to live in Iran and play a part in Iranian life? Or that part of history is ended, they are where they are now, and whether they're in the US, Europe, or Israel, uh, they left Iran behind them, so to speak, in the geographic sense, but maybe very much more historically and culturally. I think, unfortunately, that, that ship has passed. Even if there is regime change one day in Iran, uh, the presence of significant Jewish presence in Iran will uh, never be uh, returned or repeated. Uh, prior to the 1979 revolution, you had something close to 80,000 Jews that lived in Iran. They've been living there since 586 BC. That's the Babylonian exile. Right. And they were violently uh, uprooted, uh, never to return again. Um, there may perhaps be some segments of the population that have nostalgia for Iran. Uh, they are very patriotic. They may return back for business purposes to live there. Uh, but I don't think that it'll be a significant number. Um, they are really reestablish themselves in the United States, um, some parts of Europe uh, and, and in Israel. And they're, they're quite successful. And I don't think they will be returning back to live in Iran uh, if there is a regime change, will they be visiting Iran if there is regime change and a democratic Iranian government there? Absolutely. Will they be involved with business and trade? Uh, hands down. Absolutely. Uh, will they be, be involved with other aspects of uh, bringing together Israel and Iranian society and the larger Jewish community and Iran? Uh, absolutely, they will. But living... Um, as before, I highly doubt it. Um, unfortunately, the circumstances over the last 44 years right. have really been very painful and, and a, a horrific uh, experience of being forced to flee their homes and really abandon their uh, ancient roots there. Carmel, I can't thank you enough for taking the time off of your busy schedule to enlighten us all about the rich history of the Iranian Jewish community and commemorate the late Habib al Ghanian. May his memory be for a blessing and inspire us all to do more like you do and learn the past so that we may live in the present and hopefully foresee and prepare for the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Shafa, for having me and thank you to JBS for honoring Mr. Alfani on this year. 
It's always a pleasure to have Carmel Melamed with us, for him to share with us important pieces of history with you, our viewers. This helps us get to know our fellow Iranian Jews and the Iranian Jewish community a little bit better, as well as understand not just the past, as we said, but the present and even the future. I'd like to thank all of you for watching this JBS special and see you next time as we continue to explore all the things that matter right here on JBS. See you soon. Shalom and Lehitaot.